Luke chapter 19, would you be standing as we read this precious word of God, beginning in verse 28. I'm going to preach this morning on a royal procession, a royal procession. Luke 19, verse 28. And when he had thus spoken, he went before ascending up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass when he was come nigh to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying, go ye into the village over against you in the which at your entering you shall find a colt tied whereon yet never man sat. Loose him and bring him hither. So first of all, we'll just say this because I don't have time to preach on it. It was an honor in itself that he was going to he was going to sit upon this this colt <coughs> of a donkey that had never been rode and never no one had ever sat upon it and he was going to be the first <coughs> verse 31 and if any man ask you why do you loose him thus shall you say unto him because the lord hath need of him and they that were sent Went, went their way and found even as he had said unto them. And as they were loosening the colt, the owners thereof said unto them, Why loose ye the colt? And they said, The Lord hath need of him. And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt, and Jesus set, and they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way, and when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. In other words, he will be praised. And if we don't do it, the rocks and the hills will do it. You may be seated. The sermon this morning, I, I'm not saying I'm not going to preach, but as I began to study, I, as I, and I said at the very beginning of the service, this is entering into this, uh, this week of different aspects of the triumphal entry and the trial, the crucifixion, the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus from here until next Sunday and what we in the Christian faith celebrate. So this may be more of an explanation or a kickoff to this week. And really to get a better account, and, and I would encourage you to do this sometime this week, read all four accounts of just, even just of this story, uh, and then and then all four accounts of the crucifixion, all four accounts of the resurrection. It's, it's, it's not, doesn't take very long. I mean, think about it. We've been talking about this for 2,000 years and we've preached millions of sermons and wrote thousands of songs and it's really, there's not much there, okay? So it doesn't take very long to read. But sometimes to get the best perspective of the whole story, you're better off to read all four accounts. They go together perfectly. It's just they're seen from four different Viewpoints, And so different authors would point out different things. And I wanted to focus on the version in Luke because in verse 38 he says, saying, blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. And that's what I want to focus on this morning. We see that in, the, in all four accounts that right after this begins to happen, we see things that happen like, uh, Jesus curses the fig tree because it had no fruit. We know that he went in and he threw the money changers out of the temple and he turned over the tables and he said uh, that his, it was, his house was supposed to be a house of prayer. It's become a den of thieves. I mean, he lost his temper there. And, but he's Jesus, so he can do whatever he wants to do. And he had good reason for what he did, but that's not the message this morning. But this is, again, starting events that are going to lead to him within a matter of days being hung on a cross. And just a couple weeks ago, I, I preached a message 
uh, on that family day about the cross and about the crucifixion and the suffering that Jesus went through. We're not going to talk about that this morning. But all of this is leading up to it. It's a somber, in my opinion, it's a somber scripture. Have any of you ever watched um, a movie or a television show or, or just something where you found out or you knew prior to watching it or you go back to watching it and, and the, one of the main actors has since died. Maybe they died tragically. And you go back and you watch some movie or television show they were in, it, it has a somberness to it because you know that person is dead, right? They died. And so as I'm watching this, I watch it differently knowing that person is who they was just an actor or an actress, but they're no longer alive. Well, when I read these scriptures, there's a somberness of knowing what's eventually going to happen to Jesus. This is not just a thing in which he says, hey, I'm gonna go into the city and everybody's gonna praise me. And boy, when we're done, they're gonna recognize who I am. And boy, we're gonna set up a kingdom of God here on earth and everything's gonna be great. And, and, I, and, and it's just gonna go down through the ages, eventually the life changed church. And they're gonna be able to preach about the triumphal entry and all the victories that came after. No. It was leading him to die. That was the reality. It is a unique and almost unexplainable story. I've always had trouble understanding why the crowd reacted the way that they did. And we know that great crowds followed him. If you go back to just in the story, in, uh, even in passing through Jericho, he healed blind Bartimaeus. The Bible says there was a great number of people or a great crowd by this point, he had healed enough people. He had done enough miracles that when people heard that he was coming along, they would press around him because they wanted something from him. And this scripture, if you read all accounts, you'll find that they were saying that because of the wondrous works that, they, that he had done, they were praising him and they were, they were glorifying him as he came in. We also think, if you read through the scripture, that it was almost as if the disciples began the chant because they set him up on that donkey. They put their clothes on the donkey, then they set Jesus on there, and they began to praise him. And it's almost like it caught on, and then all of a sudden the people began to cheer and to praise, and they waved, and this account doesn't mention it, but they cut the branches off trees, we believe to be palm trees, Palm Sunday, and they waved those palm branches. They put their clothes, their, their garments out that he would walk, that donkey would walk on them and then they praised him as he went by. It is a absolutely beautiful scene, but I still don't quite know why the same people would react to him that way and just in a few days later, they would cry, crucify him, give us Barabbas until I remember we are dealing with human beings. I have seen it happen in the real world. I have seen, I have seen people when a coach is doing good and the coach and the team makes a big tournament run and everybody's happy and everything's great, they're the greatest coach ever. Everybody loves them. Two seasons later, they don't have the same players that they had before and they're not very good and it's all the coach's fault. Well, isn't that the same coach you had two, three years ago? Because people are fickle. I've seen people get up and brag on their pastor and just in a few years later, they're cutting them down about how bad they are. And so I'll just make sure I take this full circle. I've met some pastors that I never exactly know. Sometimes I wanna ask them, are you still pastoring the same church you were a year ago when I talked to you? Because a year ago when I talked to you, your church was great and the people were wonderful and now... They're all full of the devil. I mean, some pastors just say, oh man, things are great. Oh, we're just growing people. I tell you, our people, they, they really got a hold of something. We're growing and there's power. And then next time I see them, I'm like, oh, I'll tell you, they're so unfaithful and they won't hardly come to church and they, they just squabble. And I'm like, man, did you have 100% turnover? are the same people there. I'm trying to get you to say, it's not always the people, it's not always the pastor, sometimes it's both, but people are fickle. People are fickle. And so they praised him, they lauded him, 
But the Bible says, and I'm going to read it to you. One of the reasons that it happened, though, is because it was prophesied that it would happen. In Zechariah chapter 9 in the Old Testament, verse 9, it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, listen, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. It was prophesied this was going to happen. Your king is going to come into the city just like this. You think it was by accident that Jesus just starts a conversation and says, hey, fellas, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go into a town. I want you to go on in there, and you're going to find, <coughs> you're going to find this, this colt of a donkey, and I want you to unloose and bring it to me. You think he didn't know the scripture? He is the word. Jesus literally is the word. And so he knew the word, he knew the prophecy, and he said, I'm going to fulfill this prophecy. And I, he's stating to everyone, I am the king. And he starts a royal procession as he's coming into Jerusalem and his disciples and his followers. And people reacted to the king coming into town. I thought a few weeks ago, I don't imagine this has ever happened in the history of our community, in the history of our school, but a, I don't even know if a former governor, but definitely a sitting governor came to Western local schools. Are you kidding me? He's just tall. <laughs> I went because of the work that I do. You know, it's, it has, that you know, sort of has some economic development and things and, and training, and that's some of the stuff that we do. So there was a reason, and I was invited to go. And when I went, I know a lot of you that work at the school didn't know a lot of those people around, but I do. These are the same people I'm in other meetings and other f- events and things with all across our part of the state. But, man, it brought people out of the woodwork. I mean, people I hadn't seen in years, people I have no under, but they were coming because the governor was coming to Latham. I mean, somebody ought to start a show. You think it's funny that that Gomer Pyle went to the Marines? Some of you don't even know what I'm talking about. You older ones know what I'm talking about. You think that's funny? Well, Governor DeWine coming to Latham? That's way funnier. And I thought, what's going to happen? Who's he going to meet? Right? That's really going to reflect the community that he came. And that was just a governor of a state who, by the way, is not even going to be, can't even be running for re-election. And it turned the whole community upside down. This was the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the Son of God himself. He was coming in to die for the sins of all people. He was coming in to be lifted high on that cross to die that we might be saved. This was a royal procession. This was the King, the King coming to town. It says, thy king cometh unto thee. People get excited when governors come. People get excited for Trump rallies. I mean, look, I'm not going to get in. I don't tell people who who to vote for. I don't get into, you know, as a church, we're not going to get into politics. I tell people, you pray about it. You you pray and you vote with a clear conscience. You pray to, you, you vote according to the word of God. But I'm not going to tell you how to vote. And I'm not going to get up and talk about how I vote. But one thing I don't understand is on either side that people that get so excited to meet somebody that's not Jesus Christ himself. It's just a person. I don't get that excited to meet celebrities. I don't get that excited to meet athletes. I'm not going to get that excited to meet somebody that's running for a political office. But when I know that the king is coming, I hope that I live my life, that I know that if he's coming back today to receive his church unto him, that I have lived my life according to his word because I want to get excited when I know that Jesus is coming and he's going to call us home. That's worth getting excited about. He was going to be accused. He was going to be beaten. He was going to be humiliated and killed, but he was coming in as a king. It was about to go downhill, but he's saying, I'm going to, re- I'm going to fulfill the prophecy and I'm going to come in victorious and triumphant as a king, even though he would die. But I want to tell you something. 
when he comes again. He's not coming to, he came to be crucified. I don't want to get ahead of myself. I got this for the next point. But he came to be crucified. But when he comes the second time, he's coming to receive his people unto himself and he'll not be, he'll not be pierced with nails. He'll not be pierced with a crown of thorns. As a matter of fact, next week, Lord willing, we're, we're working on it and trying to get it ready. We're planning on singing a song. Jess is gonna sing this song. And some of the words says, they took our Holt to a courtyard and they stripped him of his clothes. They gambled on his garments with his head held low. They scorned him and they mocked him and they said, why not save yourself? If you're really who you say you are, this will be no contest. While struggling to carry that man-made torture's rack, they shouted, crucify him with the whole world's sin upon his back. With a crown of thorns upon his head and above him was his name, a soldier spat in his precious face and said, now Jesus, where's your fame? But the chorus says, they will bow before him and worship this king. They won't drive nails in his hands or his feet. They'll proclaim that in the highest, he's the Lord of everything. They shall never crucify him again. They will never have the upper hand again. He is Lord, he is Savior, he's the real king and he'll never ever be disrespected he'll never ever be tortured or bruised for us again he is above it he's paid the price number one and I've already touched on it is it is a kingly entrance it was worthy of a king because he was a king I don't have time to read it all but there's a conversation I preached on it a few weeks ago with that he has with Pilate and Pilate says are you the king? Are you a king, the king of the Jews? Jesus said, you say correctly that I am. What you said is true. He said, I came for this purpose. So I, what I want you to understand is this. The king came, but we need to stop setting up kingdoms here on earth because Jesus said, yes, I'm the king. But he says in that conversation with Pilate, but my kingdom is not of this world. He didn't come to set up a government. He didn't come to set up a, a, a nation that would dominate the earth. He said, I came, but my kingdom is not of this world. And yet we spend our lives trying to set up kingdoms here on earth. I hope I can explain this and make it sound right. As a pastor of this church, we're only nine years old. Uh, nine years ago on Easter, I know the date on Easter moves around, but in 2015 on Easter, we had a very first service. And there are times where, and look, I mean, my goodness, look what God has done and blessed. <coughs> but I look ahead way into the future. And I think I should, as a leader and a pastor, try to continue to uh, allow God to build this church in such a way that, that if I'm going tomorrow, it, continue, it will continue to go on and to thrive and to succeed. And someday when I retire, and I don't plan on being one of these preachers that wait till they're 94 years old to step aside. But that, that we have things set up in such a way that there's people in place and, and there's leadership in place that can continue to go on for the generations to come as long as the Lord it does not return if the church continue to go on. But here's the reality. If that doesn't happen, if people fail afterward and, and, and someday this just gets sold as a building, but while I was here, I did what God called me to do because this world is not our kingdom. And I can't control what happens after I'm gone. And it used to really make me sad when I would look at churches, I'd think, Oh, that church used to be this and used to be that. Well, the reality is it's all temporary because the Bible tells us that everything here will burn up and perish and that he said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And everything here, so we could build the biggest, most beautiful campus here. We could have the most wonderful facilities and we could continue to grow and everything be great. But guess what's all gonna happen? It's all gonna be destroyed. When he sets up his kingdom, 
in the new, the new Jerusalem upon the new earth. And we live our whole lives. I'm not telling you not to have a nice home. I'm certainly not telling you not to keep your yard mowed and keep things weed eaten. Because I'm kind of particular about that stuff. I'm not telling you not to, not to, you know, keep your flower bed weed eaten and all that kind. I'm not, I'm not telling you that. But I'm telling you, don't obsess upon things that don't matter because Jesus is saying my kingdom is not of this earth and we spend our lives building up a kingdom here and someday you're gonna leave it behind. The biggest home, the biggest business, the biggest reputation, the biggest things that you have, the biggest bank accounts, one of these days, you're gonna leave it all behind. I know it's an old cliche, but it's very, very true and that I've never seen a hearse with a U-Haul behind it. When you leave this world, you're gonna leave it like you came, with nothing, with nothing. So stop worrying about your kingdom here on earth and worry about the kingdom that is to come. Secondly, not only was it a kingly entrance, he was setting up a kingdom of peace. Some of you may not realize why it was important, not just prophesy, but why it was important that he rode in on a donkey. Because a donkey, some say, why wouldn't he ride in on a horse? A horse is a symbol of war, but a donkey was a symbol of peace. So he's letting everyone know, yes, I'm the king. I'm fulfilling the scripture that said a king will ride in on a donkey, but also my kingdom will be a kingdom of peace. I pray that our church, I pray that your personal worlds, your homes, your relationships would be relationships and lives and homes of peace. Nothing can cause us stress and anxiety as that constant turmoil that is going on. Strive for peace. I'm not telling you to not stand up for things that are against things that are wrong. I'm not telling you not to stand up for things that are right, but I'm trying to tell you as much as you can, the Bible teaches us, as much as we can live peaceably among men. Sometimes it's okay. Now, like we, we get into things on Facebook and I'm always, I always say this, when if I put something on Facebook and you start commenting on my Facebook, then you've opened yourself up to whatever it is I want to reply back to you. <laughs> like, don't enter the chat unless you want to hear what I've got to say back to you, okay? But on the other hand, there are times, and this is what I, I can't tell you when it's right and I can't tell you when it's wrong, but there are times when I have felt the Holy Spirit say, you'll do more damage than good. Now, not all the time. Again, I'm not telling you what's right and what's wrong. You have to discern and allow the Holy Spirit to lead you because sometimes we do need to stand up for what's right. We need to voice our opinions as children of God and believers of the word. But sometimes our goal should be to live peaceably at home, husbands and wives, live peaceably I need to preach that a little more. If I need to, if anybody just point. If you point somebody, I'll preach a little longer. Live peaceably. At home, in the workplace. Don't constantly be the problem at work. Be the bearer of peace. In your family, in the community. In 2 Corinthians I've, I've got it pulled up here. He says, I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence where I think to be bold against some, which think of us as we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations in every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And so sometimes we want to fight with sticks and stones and God is saying, fight with peace, fight with love, fight with patience, fight with understanding. 
that not everybody has the same background as you. There are times in my life I get so frustrated over, I know this isn't Father's Day. Usually, you know, Father's Day, we blast all the fathers pretty good and tell them how bad they are. That's what happens in most churches on Father's Day. Mother's Day, we just brag on them, tell them they're wonderful. Father's Day, we come in and we say, you need to do better. But sometimes I, I, I do get, I get frustrated in the world we live that young men are not becoming men. Men that will take care of their family, men that will defend their family, men that will stand up to their families and say, I am the head of the house. And just, just be men, just do what men ought to do. And so sometimes uh, in those cases, we're talking about war and having peace and this and that. So sometimes as a man, there may be an occasion in which a man has to do something that's seen as an act of aggression to protect his family or to, to stand up against something. But the reality is, even with all of that, the, that sense of peace in the home will come as the man has peace with God. And it will, it will then filter out through the rest of the family that there's peace in the home. It was a kingdom of peace. And th lastly, he came on this royal procession because he would keep his word. He would keep his word. Jesus had been preparing his followers for what was about to happen. Even if they didn't understand it or they couldn't understand it, if you read back through all the Gospels, there are different times where he's trying to prepare them and explain to them, and they just don't get it. But he lets them know this is what's going to happen. And they sort of, for a little while, they sort of fall apart. But eventually, they, they come back, they get it together, and they come back. But he's doing this because he's going to keep his word. He is heading to the cross. His flesh didn't want it. He goes to the garden to pray. And he says, Father, not my will, but thine be done. And he keeps his word and he goes to the cross. And I think at times that we, we think that it was easy for Jesus to do this because he was God. His flesh, his will and desire was no different than yours and mine. He did not want to do this. Anybody ever get anxiety just over a dentist appointment? You're like, oh man, I'm gonna be in there for like an hour. I gotta have a root canal. You're just like, ugh, I really don't wanna go and do this. He was going to be tortured and crucified. You think he's like, when he got up in the morning, he's like singing early morning songs and happy about it? No, he looked, no doubt he woke up like a lot of you, dreading the day. <laughs> but he kept his word. And he kept his word because he loved us. Amen. As Dave and Tim come this morning, again, I know it may have been a little bit different of a message. It may have been more just to trigger our minds to get us ready for this week, but this was the beginning of all that was going to happen. All that you'll read about this week, all that you may watch, <coughs> stories that you may watch, stories you may read, I do encourage you. Find time this week to read the gospel accounts. And if you just want to kind of start where I, where I was at, if you want to start at the triumphal entry and read all four gospels, I promise it doesn't take very long. And, and you'll be to the resurrection. For thousands of years now, this book and this story has changed the world. And the royal procession when he came in, People had said, who, remember, he asked his disciples, he said, who do men say that I am? They said, some say you're John the Baptist. John the Baptist was already dead, but you're John the Baptist, raised from the dead. Some say you're, you're Elijah the prophet. But he looked at him, he's, he's almost just saying, that doesn't matter though. I asked the question, but it doesn't matter. I want to know something. Who do you say that I am? And they looked at him and said, thou art the Christ, son of the living God. 
this morning. The crowd may have turned. The crowd may have been fickle. But I want to ask you the question, who do you say that he is? Is he the king? Is he the king of your life? Is he the king of your heart? Is he the king of your family? If he's not, he can't be this morning. And as we stand all over the building,